Okay. Um, so we're going to continue our discussion of uh, um, of uh, phi to the fourth theory, large n phi to the fourth theory. So let me remind you of the theory we were studying. The Euclidean action was dealt with phi i and mu phi i and mu i by u plus m naught squared phi i phi i by two. Okay. Uh, plus, and I think uh, we have used slightly different notation last time. We have to help me. Sorry, we four by four. Some number that's been fixed in the last element by n. Uh, I'm not sure if I call it by two by four. I'm not sure if I call it g o v four. Something. Okay, let's use this notation. Okay, uh, and then what we did was we found an exact expression. Well, we got we found an exact expression for the two point function, the propagator of the five. And let me remind you how we did that. Uh, we did two ways. Um, one way was just diagrammatic. Okay, and the other way was completing a square. Okay. Let me do it by completing the square method again. Um, if we had some problems with factors of two, let's get that straight. Okay, so uh, the completing the square method takes that b for b four by a blah blah and write it as uh, 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 n by two b four times uh, sigma. Minus phi i phi i um, into v four This term, right? Um, but uh, it adds two additional terms. So we have to subtract those. Again. The first thing we have to add to so this quantity, I'm just rewriting this quantity as yeah, this um, minus n by b4 sigma squared by 4 plus. Sigma phi i phi i Okay? So just as a simple algebraic identity, this quantity is equal to this. Okay? Um, for um, uh, right. For uh, any field sigma. Okay. And now now we um, Sorry, let me just do it again. Start again. 
Um, I want to rewrite this object as what comes by integrating out. So I want to write this as I want, sorry, I want to write it as sigma by 2 phi i phi i plus some number I can straight. In a minute, sigma n a sigma squared plus minus And the point was that if I uh, now complete the square for this object, um, so, so let me call this plus e. If I now complete the square for this object, um, I can write this as
we would we, the idea was to do the path of type over phi's, and then we would do the path of type over sigma. The path of type over sigma was one field. The action was going to be of order n. We could do that classically. If we didn't have to do an integral over sigma, so if we expect the standard point value, the mean field value of sigma, to be translationally invariant, then we can just set sigma translationally invariant in some number from the get-go. And in doing that, then we got this this quantity here. So we did the integral. That's an inverse determinant, uh, square root of an inverse determinant. N copies of that. So so the action was equal to minus n back to log of b squared plus uh, m not squared plus sigma uh, three p by q. Okay. Uh, plus sigma oh sorry, plus minus n sigma squared by four before. Okay. And then doing the integral path and integral over sigma was the same as doing the path and integral over sigma was the same as just classically minimizing the action. The classical minimization to the table is minus n by two integral the P by two by the Q one over P squared plus not squared plus sigma. Okay, uh, minus n sigma by two P four. appears as m not squared plus sigma. So sigma looks like the self-energy process. We verify this idea by recomputing this, this equation using diagonalities. Okay? So how do we recompute using diagrammatics? Well, um, it was basically this, this, this equation that sigma the self-energy is equal to uh, sigma is equal to minus p three p by two by u. Um, d three p by two pi is equal to q times uh, uh, one over p squared plus m not squared plus. Okay. Now we have to get the numbers and signs and so on and factors, right? So uh, where did we get that from? We got we got this. We took a single five to the four vertex down. Okay, we took a single five to the four vertex down, and then we closed off one of the one of the legs. Taking the single five to the four vertex down uh, gives us a factor of uh, uh, if we just use this thing of b four by four n. Then there's a choice of two, but which kind close up? So that's the factor of two, and uh, uh, about the sign, uh, uh, about the sign length. Uh, about the sign. Okay, let's let's also get the sign straight. Uh, third equation like s equal to plus n by two. Very good. Thank you. Uh, it is uh, Ronald's point is that we write the action as e to the power minus s. We write the path integral as e to the power minus s. So that even though we got minus n by two, I mean we got the determinant in the denominator, we got minus n by two. Once we exponentiate that, we have to write that as e to the power minus something. That's a plus. Yes. So this is a plus. Yeah. Why is this a plus? It's just because uh, there are two minuses that cancel. You see, when we pull this factor down. This factor down, we get it with the minus because we're doing e to the power minus s. But then we have to equate it to the mass, which also comes with the minus. Okay? So whatever we get is going to be written as sigma minus sigma by 2 phi squared. Okay? So whatever this diagram is, is equal to minus sigma by 2. 
Maybe the sigma appears in the same way as a mass squared appears, and that appears as mass squared by 2 with a minus sign because of the to the power minus s reaction. Okay? But this diagram came with a factor, as we just said, of minus g4 by 4. Then there was a factor of 2, because the choice of which guy is close up. There was the 1 over n, but we got rid of that because of the n different ways of contracting this. Okay? And so, of the equation of sigma is equal to b4 by 2, uh, D3 uh, D3 exactly the same. Oh, we're still missing a factor of two. We're still missing a factor. That's it. Ah. Uh, no, we actually not the same factor. We see. Because sigma by two, this, that's what you're saying. This is to be equated to sigma by two. You understand why is, uh, this is what I'm asking. You understand why this is to be related, equated to sigma by two? Because we, when we re exponentiate it up in the action, we want to write as something by two. Okay? So now there's no by two, because this two, the two cancels here. Okay? And uh, there's no by two here. Two is cancelled. Okay, yeah, perfect. So it's exactly the same. D P by two by over Q one over P squared plus M naught squared plus N. Okay, this was our computation of the exact property. We also last time did a calculation of the exact scattering amplitude, the two to two particle scattering amplitude. I won't go through the calculation again. Uh, but you remember the key point we took away from that was there were no divergences. So we wanted the scattering amplitude to stay fixed uh, in the limit lambda naught goes to infinity. We have to hold g naught or b four fixed. Okay. So now we are really set to do renormalization in this very simple. In this very simple yet not completely trivial thing. Okay. So now let's try to see how we do that. What we're going to hold fixed is, let's say, the four point, the four, the four for, uh, goes on scattering, something. Uh, so you effectively hold B four fixed, okay? And we will also hold fixed um, the pole of the product. Okay. So let's say that the pole of the propagator, uh, whatever it is. Okay, the pole of the propagator, whatever it is, we call it m square. We're going to hold it fixed. Okay, but m square clearly, as we've seen, is m naught squared plus c. Okay, so we can take this equation and write it as uh, m squared minus m naught squared. Okay, it's equal to d three p by two pi over q. Over v squared plus n squared. Now, in this equation, m naught is some as here unknown function of lambda. Uh, and there's a g there, b4. b4, but this is some fixed number. Okay? So, uh, b4 is fixed because it's required to be fixed at the scattering. Okay? Now, so this is some as yet unknown function of lambda now. But now we can find what function of lambda naught we need to this equation. So let's try to understand what this function looks like. Firstly, at a very large momentum, there's a divergence. Well, first, firstly, let's do dimensional analysis. Okay? Dimensional analysis tells us that this quantity is of dimension mass. So if it was a converted integral, it would be some number type of integral. Right? That's what it's going to be. But it's not a converted d3 by p square of not b. So the lean model behavior here will be b4 times some number which would be very easy to determine. Just write d3 p and polar coordinates and uh, divide by p square by not bother to do that one number. Uh, times lambda. Okay. Plus, okay, maybe let's give 
bit sophisticated. Let's be a bit sophisticated. Let's write this quantity, this quantity here, as B4 into B3P by B5 cube in a 1 by P squared plus M squared minus 1 by P squared plus 1. I've done nothing, standard and subtract something. What's the point? The point is that the divergent fields are isolated to make it M independent. Okay? So this quantity, whatever it is, is some number times lambda, as we discussed. This quantity on the other hand is not convergent. Because it goes like by combining fractions, you'll easily see that it goes at large the integral goes at large p, the quantity of p to the four. Okay. Now it's a convergent integral, and by dimensional analysis, it's some number times n. Okay, the two numbers are very easy to determine, but the irrelevant to what I'm going to say is some number times n. Okay, so this quantity has b4 times number one times n. Okay, plus number two times one. Okay, but this number one and number two are very easy to determine. The numbers. How do you determine that, by the way? How will you determine this guy? Well, we simply move to polar coordinates. This would be 4 pi times p squared divided by p squared. Um, so 4 pi times p squared times dp. So in fact, the number is 4 pi by 2 pi over the cube. Because it takes the degrees. Since it's that easy, This number is as easy to determine. Tell me how you do it. Well, one way to do it is to rescale m out of the integral. Define p is x times n. Okay, that rescaling explicitly makes this this quantity um, explicitly makes this object m times a dimensionless pure number. That pure number is the integral one over x squared plus one minus one over x squared. B three x by two pi. This is a definite integral over all x. Okay, some number. Easy to evaluate. Only a minute. Okay, and whatever the number is, we call it pi. Pure numbers, like pi. Is Normalization group closed. 
what have you There was a free fixed point here. There's this interactive fixed point that we're trying to reach. Okay? Now what we've done here is to find the theory with two parameters. Okay. The two parameters are B4 and A. So clearly what we've done is define the quantum field and tell you that uh, zeros in around a fixed point. There is two random directions. So that's the free theory. Okay. So we had the flows from this free theory went like that. This is the mass square direction. This is the V4 direction. And what we've done is to make sure that we're sitting something. Okay. By the way, uh, if we wrote this m naught squared in uh, dimensionless coordinates, okay. Uh, so let's say that we write x two is equal to m naught squared by lambda naught squared, and x four is equal to b four by lambda naught. Okay. Then the beta, the uv beta function equations. The beta function equations that tell us how we have to scale. The uh, bare parameters in order to hold uh, physical stuff fixed. Uh, what do we get? We get dx2 by d log of lambda r. Continue to hold the pole mass fixed. 
because we want to keep the relevant deformation for this new fixed point. Fixed itself. Okay? So we want to continue to keep the pole mass fixed. But we want to flow as far as we can go in this direction. Now, oh, uh, Now, the point is this B4 dimension. That's the dimension two. This is the mass dimension one. Okay? B4 zero is not renormalized. It's just held fixed. But that means that as we flow to the IR, X4 becomes larger and larger and larger. Because X4 is B4 divided by lambda. Okay? And that will become larger and larger and larger. Okay? So how are we going to achieve flowing to this fixed point? Okay? You see, there are basically only two distinguished values of B4. There's zero and there's infinity. Okay? Since we found no other fixed point in the space of flows of B4, it's not like there was a non trivial uh, beta function equation for B4. Okay? There could have been like some fixed point and some finite value. But there wasn't. Okay? So it just flows, starts from zero, goes to infinity. So this theory apparently is defined by taking the limit, the assume the only possibility is B4 to infinity. So now what we want to do is to define this kind of model in the limit B4.8. That is the candidate for the second fixed point. Okay. Great. So, uh, so let's first look at our equation. Let's first go back and look at our gap equation. So first, first fixed point we've understood. It's not very interesting. Uh, the question is how do we understand the second fixed point? Okay. So let's first look at our gap equation in which we have. Um, uh, let us look at our gap equation once again. Okay, even before that, let me do one manipulation just a bit. You see. When we did this completing of the square, we saw that the action came with a B4 by 2 sigma squared. 4 and sigma squared. Uh, do you remember? When we wrote this thing in terms of sigma. You see, so if we took the limit B4 to infinity in this language, it looks pretty singular. Okay? But if we take the limit B4 to infinity in this language, it doesn't look singular at all. It just looks like the sigma square term is vanishing. Okay? So now let's do this properly, including the effect of the mass. Let's do this calculation properly. Yeah. Uh, what we have done here was to rewrite this term yes. uh, as uh, B as uh, you have to help me with the numbers. So sigma squared n by 4b4. Four four. Four. Yeah, okay. Plus uh, sigma phi i phi i. We replaced this term by these two terms. I'm saying here it looks very easy to take the limit before. Because we take before it it's just dropping the stuff. Okay? Whereas B4 with the infinity in this language looks like a rather strange and singular thing to do. Once you do this Hubbard's Titanovich trick, you see that B4 with the infinity is a rather simple thing. Okay. So effectively, uh, it's effectively dropping this, 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 this square term. Now I want to do this a bit carefully. I want to do this a bit carefully, um, uh, including this term. So I want to do a completing of the square in a way that will also eliminate this term. Yeah, good question. Oh yeah, so, so what if we try to like just observe the infinity of the B4 in the end? In what? In n. We can work before by n. No, but n appears in another place. That is the number of i indices. Oh right. 
So, yeah. So this is not the only place that happens. You get right. Okay. Good. So now let's 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 proceed. Let's do this rewriting in terms of sigma in a way that eliminates this object as well as this object in favor of a linear term. Right. So. Uh, what we're going to try to do is the following. We're going to try to arrange an action so that it has um, so that it has uh, what we had here, which was n by b4 by 4 b4 4 sigma squared. Then uh, can you somebody tell me what the the sign right for this? Playing in minus. Minus. Okay. Plus some number that I don't get more. That's what it is. Times sigma. Uh, and plus sigma phi i phi i. Okay. I'm going to try to uh, to replace both those terms in the action then. Oh, where is the thing? I don't have to put it. To try to eliminate this. Okay? So, now, in order to see how that goes, what I do is, as usual, I just complete this one. Okay? So, I write this as minus n by 4 b4 into um, sigma. Uh, th this term will come with a plus? That was a plus, right? So sigma minus uh, minus two b four a by n um, minus two b four by n phi i phi i for the square plus that. Okay, so what is my plus stuff? My plus stuff is whatever was not here, so whatever didn't involve a sigma. Okay, so it's this stuff squared. So plus n by 4 b4 into, um, so 4 cancels. Okay. 
Now, this term into this is precisely this. That's what was made originally an engine. Now, what I want to do is to choose this A. So that this term into this is precisely this. Okay? That will work if uh, B for A uh, B for A Uh, 
we'll see, we'll see its interpretation in a moment. Now, this fixed. You know what's going on here in terms of renormalization group flows in the following. What we're doing is taking a theory that was, suppose we took one of these theory, the theory that was here and flowed it for a very long time. We wouldn't reach here in terms of B4. We would also have zoomed off in terms of mass. Okay? So we're doing this thing that we talked about a lot. That if we want to define a theory about this fixed point, we have to scale our mass so that it approaches this critical surface while we are waiting to flow for a long time. And that's basically, uh, that's achieved by this, this funny scaling of it. Okay. So this unit here, uh, B4 goes to infinity, M0 squared goes to infinity, M0 squared by 2 B4, which is some A which is held fixed, uh, uh, defines a sensible path. Okay. Now, in this limit, we can just simply drop this term and replace this term here by E. Okay? And this is now a new path integral that is a candidate definition for the new fixed point. Okay? This, th this term here is sometimes called the nonlinear, this theory is sometimes called the nonlinear sigma model. Why is it called nonlinear sigma model? It's called nonlinear sigma model because if you now look at the equation of motion for sigma, written like this, it's a very simple equation. It tells you that phi bar phi by 2 is equal to e. So, it's like we're doing a path integral over n different vectors, subject to the condition that the vectors we're path integrating over have a fixed modulus. Okay? That's so the, the, the first lesson is that the Wilson Fisher fixed point uh, is defined as deformations around the nonlinear sigma. Okay. Now let's work out the gap equation again for this thing. Now we don't need to work out scattered, there's only one pattern. So in order to understand how we have to, to, so there's only, you know, uh, one object in the game, that's the same. Okay? And no, in order to try to do renormalization of this theory, we just have to uh, uh, worry about how this A scales uh, with lambda naught as we take lambda naught into it. Okay? So now we work with this simpler Lagrangian in some sense than the original Lagrangian, earlier Lagrangian. So we do all the same things that we did before. Okay, what are the same things we did before? Well, we integrate out this uh, the phi field. So our s is equal to n by two log of uh, e squared plus m plus uh, p squared plus sigma. Only sigma, no n. P squared plus sigma plus I forgot the sigma here. N A sigma. Okay? Now we're going to get the gap equation. Okay, now we're going to get the gap equation, I get this and differentiate it for this picture. Okay, so I get the uh, ends, ends are overall, so I forget about them. My gap equation is 1 over 2 times integral d3 p by 2 pi the whole thing q, 1 over p squared plus sigma. This is the um, Now, if I had written this as, if I really wrote it as such, uh, that would be a minus sign. But no. A is now regarded in this new Lagrangian. A is the bare parameter. Okay, A is the parameter of the Lagrangian. 
So here's going to be some function of lambda naught that, uh, that I have to arrange uh, for this equation to be satisfied. Okay? And now, once again, I will do the same analysis that I did before. So, uh, um, this left hand side here this is equal to half into what was it? So it was 1 by 4 pi squared. 1 by 4 pi squared. Uh, 1 by 4 pi squared, lambda naught. Uh, I just changed my definition. I wrote, I redefined A to minus A. That's it. I mean, it's a parallel. Just to have a plus sign. You could have changed the difference. Okay? So, uh, lambda naught by 4 pi squared plus this I1 by 2 uh, sigma is equal to A of Scaling dimension of the operator 
phi squared, the, 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 the relevant operator about of this theory. Okay? And if you go and look at the formula we derived last time, you'll find that the operator dimension, this operator dimension is equal to 2. Okay? So uh, just to say it again, we had a form we had a formula for how the correlation length scales in terms of the scaling dimension of the operator. Okay? Sigma is just the inverse of the correlation length. Okay, and so somebody can just read off that formula from last time. Um, What we've got here is that what? Sigma is scaling like L basically sigma is scaling like one over L times. L times two. And this is L times two. Sig uh, the correlation length is the inverse of the mass, which is just 1 over the square root of the sigma. So sigma scaling like 1 over L times 2. And we have a formula for how sigma scales and in terms of the dimension of this operator is, some, is an easily accessible sum. You'll have to derive the game. Hmm? Yeah. Sigma went like 1 over uh, so, uh, 1 over L times 2 whatever to the power nu 3 minus It's nu. But we have sigma going like 1 over L times 2. That means nu is equal to 2. Okay? Now notice that nu in the free theory was 1. It was the dimension of the operator phi squared. Phi is dimension half infinity. It's phi squared dimension. Nu is equal to 2 is far from free behavior. And this is basically the square root, the square root that you get in this. Okay, that, 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 that made the difference. Okay? It's connected to the fact that this that this A guy here had a B4 in it when expressed in terms of A1 squared. And that B4, as far as this theory is concerned, is a UE scale. So you can trace, trace this fact back. Okay, so we've we found something pretty interesting already. Our solution of this theory has already told us that the operator phi squared, the rel that the relevant operator about this free fixed point has nu is equal to Okay, um, there are many other things one could do with this theory. Okay, so given that we have nu is equal to two. We can now compute, for instance, if you want to know how the specific heat of this theory uh, scales as a function of temperature difference as you scale to the critical fixed point, we have the formula for that. We just plug in new. Okay? Um, uh, our renormalization group flow did not lead, did not require us to do any wave function. It wasn't like we needed to scale the del phi squared like some function of, with some function of lambda naught in order to keep everything finite. Okay, this state, this fact, as we have discussed, uh, the, the wave function renormalization is linked to the scaling dimension of, of the operator phi. The fact that there's no wave function renormalization tells us that in this theory, the operator phi i by itself continues to have its free scaling dimension. Okay. So the operator phi i, dimension of phi i is equal to half. The dimension of phi i phi i is equal to two. It's one of these strange things that can happen in the quantum theory, right? That the, uh, the dimension of phi i phi i is not the same as dimension of phi i. For more precisely, the dimension of the relevant operator. Even to say that this is phi i phi i is an inaccuracy. The dimension of the one relevant operator around the interacting fixed point. These two numbers enable us uh, via the discussion we had in the last class to compute all critical exponents. Okay? So 
if we were if we were if this this discussion that we had uh, was to be applied to our discussion of statistical physics. Uh, for phase transitions, we're more or less true. Of course, uh, viewed as viewed in terms of high energy physics, there's a lot more one can do in this theory. It's interesting, for instance, to study the details of scattering in this theory. Uh, in the last class, we found uh, an explicit formula for the scattering activity. Um, let me let me just show you what happens to the formula a little bit before the school finish. We found that the S matrix okay, was B four by A into one minus B four by N times some symmetric factor that I don't remember. Then T three B by Q by the Q times one over Let's call this D3R. The loop. 1 over R squared plus N squared. In a P plus R squared plus N squared. Where well, this M is square root of sigma. M is square root of sigma. The whole mass of the Okay? Uh, this was an exact formula for scattering in this theory at any value. Now, to get scattering in the critical theory, scattering in this nonlinear sigma model theory, about the non trivial fixed point, what were we supposed to do? We were supposed to go to pole mass fixed, taking before the infinity. Okay. And at first, you might think, wow, that means scattering blows up. And certainly in perturbation theory, if you took before the infinity, scattering would blow up. Because each term of perturbation theory is proportional to B4, B4 squared, B4 cube, and so on. But if you're really defining the new good quantum field theory, scattering should not blow up. How does that work? It works beautifully. See, because the door is a B4 numerator, this one is the denominator. So the B4 goes to infinity limit is well defined. And in fact, we estimate traits. Oh, and you remember what this capital P was, by the way, right? P, yeah. P1. P1, P2, P3, P4, and uh, P was P1 plus P2. Okay, but this, these guys are indices, I are these guys. Okay, so in this limit, S about the critical theory simply becomes 1. 1 over A with the minus sign times integral D3 P by 2 pi. Cube, 1 over r squared plus n squared into p plus r the whole thing squared plus n squared. <coughs> okay? It's what? Ah, I can't figure it out to draw this one. The whole scattering amplitude is proportional. I understand. Okay. And, you know, this is perfectly good behavior. Just one last thing because we'll be discussing this in a couple of lectures. But how you can the constraints, I don't believe your scattering amplitude. Um, one last thing. The last thing I'm going to talk about is how, uh, how this S matrix behaves at large momentum. At large momentum, we can basically forget about this. Okay. So this quantity here is d3r by r to the 4 uh, dimension b. Okay, so it's 1 over b. Okay, and therefore s goes like 1 over n times p. Now p, if you view the scattering process in this channel, is simply the center of mass energy. So p is square root of s. S goes right times square root of S. Okay. Uh, and uh, as we will see, as we will see as we come into a series discussion of scattering, uh, 
This can be done. This is good high energy behavior for this can be This pendulum galactic correction is the is the fastest growth of scattering energies in the Okay, fine. So I think I'm going to stop my discussion of this little toy model. Okay, uh, we've solved this theory in the large element. We've solved it well enough to understand its critical poles. We've solved it well enough to understand scattering influence. Okay, and uh, there are many little exercises one can do with this theory. Um, it's it's a beautiful example of a solvable quantum field theory, where you can illustrate general ideas in a very simple way. Because because it's solvable, it's simpler than most quantum theory. So not every idea gets illustrated, but some. Okay. It's a nice toy model to play around with if you ever get confused. Okay, um, fine. I think that's all I wanted to say about this five, five to four theory, and I think that's all I'm going to say about purely scalar theories in this, in this course. Uh, we're now going to turn our attention to much more interesting theories involving gauge uh, and fermions. Uh, any questions or comments?
do that, your spins have fixed modulus, but they live in one dimension. So they can either plus one or minus one. Okay. So, so there is some sense in which you, it's a bit similar. Oh, one vector model, whatever that means. So there's a sigma model, there's something like this I think. It's discrete. O2 and O2 is completely straightforward. Okay. Uh, by the way, the O2, I, I, I talked about the Ising model, but there are many actual systems in nature which have a, an O2 that is the same as U1 symmetry. Uh, so even ma ma magnetic systems, you could write out a, a, a theory of a, a classical magnetism in which the, the fields are vectors that live in a plane. Okay, it's called, sometimes called planar Ising. Okay. And that the phase transitions of that system are governed by this O2 non okay? You could write out a, a, a classical magnetic system where the fields, and this is very natural, are a, a vector that live in three dimensional space. That, the phase transition, that model is governed by the O3 non system. So, this problem is of use at different values of n in its own right. So it's a good thing to generalize our study of 5 to the 4 theory to this OM theory just in its own right. But it's also of use as some way of, you know, adding a parameter to the, to the idea. Okay, of course, it's hard to find examples in nature which realize any equals infinity. Okay, so where we can solve it, it's hard to find instantiations in nature. But uh, that's okay, you know. Theorists will never get beyond a certain point. Okay, that's the structure of mathematics. Some mathematical problems are so difficult that human beings likely will never find exact solutions. Theorists are in the game of finding exact solutions or approximations around those. Uh, and, you know, that's the limitation of this kind of theory. The kind of theory that doesn't say just put it on a computer. It's a limitation. You, you know from the get-go that you're not even going to do everything. So the job of the theorist is to find the solvable points and to make a qualitative picture based on what he can, he or she can. So we do it very well with this logic. Sir, do we study the intent zero? Sorry? Intent zero. Intent zero. Maybe you can have some <laughs> funny way, but... Uh, so it's a factor, the n-vector model. Okay, I don't know anything about this. For me, yeah. I was an integer. Yeah, but uh, um, yeah. you could formally study it, I suppose. Yeah. Uh, but then you say that this also has a uh, physical instantiation. Yeah, yeah. I don't know about this. Okay, uh, that's interesting. It's like the dimension. <laughs> Okay. Uh, but this thing has uh, more supply at some point in time to the theory of finance. Or the, the sigma model? Yeah. Okay. So how does it relate to finance? How does it relate to finance? Let me explain that. Okay, so this is a bit of a diversion. But since most of you know more than what has been taught in this course, it's okay, right? Nice. So, <laughs> so, uh, I just going to get some joke. There is some sort of cyber side of 
and in the Now, what? Like a BEC. BEC. So it's like a, a cosine sine. Yes, yes. Now, just that this expectation value is not equal to zero in the QCD vacuum. Yeah, that's the statement. Okay, so the fact that this is not zero uh, leads to spontaneous breaking of some of the symmetries of the QCD. Now, it's only a, what I'm saying is only approximate when quarks have mass. So let me work in this person's ideal element where quarks are massless. In the limit where quarks are massless, as it, uh, it's suppose you have three quark flavors, the uh, up, the down, and uh, strange, which are approximately massless on the scale of the gives not that you see. Or we could work with two if you want. Really, very, very accurately massless. Scale of the gives up to the down. Okay? Um, if you have a theory of two or three, it doesn't matter, some number of massless quarks, then as you know, as you know, this theory has an um, SU, well, has classically a U, let's, let's fix a number, let's call it 2, or let's call it 3, let's call it 3, it has a U3 times U3 symmetry, a symmetry in which you independently can rotate the left and right of the quarks, because the only time that runs in the big system. The only time the Lagrangian in the big system is the master. If the master is zero. Okay. Now, uh, this is the symmetry of the, uh, of the theory, and that's a long story about this, which we will go, most of which we go through. Okay. But the, the part of the story is that you can take, so this U3 and U3 can be thought of as acting on left and right mobile sectors, but you can also think of it as acting on. Uh, in a diagonal and off diagonal fashion. You understand what I mean? Equal action on the left and right movers and opposite action on the left and right movers. That's another basis for this U3 tension. Now, <coughs> as we will discuss in this course, but as you already know, not every symmetry of a classical theory is a symmetry of the quantum. Okay? It turns out that the diagonal actions, <coughs> uh, it turns out that the diagonal actions, of these, uh, uh, of the CO3 time the break, continue to be symmetries of the quantum theory. But the inverse diagonal, one which it acts opposite to left to right, okay, of the U, of that U3, okay, SU3 continues to be a, a symmetry of the quantum theory. But the U1 does not, it's anomalous. Okay? So as we are doing the quantum theory, we just there's a lot more to say, but we just forget about the U1 for this discussion. Okay? Now, so there is a global symmetry of the theory which is U3 times SU3. The U3 is sometimes called the vector U3, and the SU3 is sometimes called the axial. Uh, axial. Now it turns out that this condensate, okay, it turns out that this condensate, uh, uh, <coughs> uh, but this content, so now, now wherever you've got something condensing, uh, and you've got a global symmetry, it's very important to know how the condensate trans uh, transforms under the symmetry. In particular, it's important to know which symmetries of the theory uh, are annihilated by the condensate. You know, which symmetries are symmetries even in the presence of the condensate. Don't change the condensate. Okay? And the U3 the vector symmetries continue to be symmetries even in the presence of the condensate. Condensate has that character. Okay? However, the axial symmetries do not. Now, whenever you've got a symmetry of a Lagrangian, that's not a symmetry of your vacuum. You have Goldstone muscles. You have muscle squeals. But what 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 is the good what is the good way of parametrizing these muscle squeals? The good way of parametrizing these muscle squeals is simply by the action of the symmetry group on the vacuum. Okay? So, this, the space of vacua of the theory that are rotated into each other by the action of this, this, this broken symmetry is some group cosine. Okay? And 
the theory of the low energy theory is the Goldstone bosons that describe fluctuations on this planet. Okay? And that theory, that theory is a sigma model on some appropriate space. Okay. Uh, <coughs> whose physics is very similar to what we've discussed, except that it's a four. Okay. Uh, much of this we will, be, we will try to discuss in detail when we discuss UCD. Okay, but well, this was just an appetizer. Okay, uh, any other questions? No, it's four dimensions. Nothing at all. Uh, sigma models in four dimensions are boring. Sigma models in three dimensions. Are okay. Uh, any other questions? Okay. So let's move. Let's move. Okay. Uh, now the course, uh, our course is going to move on to now study. Uh, Yangman's theories. Okay? But since we've discussed these large end limits here, um, I was thinking of introducing the study of Yangman's theory um, through the study of the solvable model of Yangman's theory. Very much like we discussed here. Uh, this is a beautiful solvable model solved by Tuft. It's called the Tuft model. It's a model of Yangman's theory today. Okay. Just like this, this theory of, uh, uh, of uh, scalar fields was solvable in, uh, uh, in the large end of it, uh, the Toft model is also solvable in the large end of it. Okay. And as preparation for that, I wanted to do a little more discussion. Okay, so let me clarify first. I, sa I, I said that we're going to turn to now to the study of Yang and What do I mean? In the beginning of the course, of course, we did some kinematics. We talked about the path integral of the angle theory, we talked about its inverse space interpretation, we talked about the path of Popov, uh, gauge fixing, and so on. But there's a very big difference between discussing the kinematics of the theory and the dynamics of the theory. Again, like we've seen with the study of these scalar theories, you know, there's very interesting stuff hidden in these <coughs> scalar theories new fixed points, critical exponents, and so on. That it's not obvious when you just look at the diagram. Okay, it's not obvious from the kind of, you know, kind of facile analysis we do in the beginning of the course. Now these Hilbert spaces. That's like, okay, that's that's just yeah, that's just kinematics. How the theory actually behaves is an interesting question. Now, um, let me start by introducing the questions. Okay, the theory we can study is F nu nu F plus some matters. For instance, if we want to study the kind of theory that we see in the real world, we'd add some number of formulas. Back with some else. This is a branch in here, describes the angle theory interacting with fermions, and it's a very good description of the physics of the strong interaction. Quarks interacting with SU3 gauge fields. Very good description, I say not exact, because I'm ignoring the weak interactions and so on. But for many processes, you can ignore the weak interactions. Okay, a process involving quarks. This, this physics, this, this, this simple one line. Two term Lagrangian captures a huge amount of physics. Okay? And at the beginning of our course, we, uh, we discussed we discussed some, you know, the structure of non-abelian gate invariances, we discussed uh, the Hilbert space of the theory, and, and so on. Now we're interested in more interesting things than that kind of formal analysis. We're interested in knowing how this theory behaves. Okay? So, one of the things we're going to do in the next few lectures is to compute the beta function of this gauge coverage. Okay? And as you know, we're going to find 
that the beta function is such that g grows to a theta. Okay? Therefore, we will conclude that this theory is defined as a flow away. This theory is defined as a flow away from a field. Okay? It's a theory with, let's say, if I. Okay. Let me first, in our minds, throw this away. Let's say that we have no books. This theory now is a theory with exactly one marginally relevant value. This is the same theory. Okay? And, so the, the, the flows of that theory are very simple. This is zero. Towards the IR, G increases. As far as we know, in this theory, there is no additional fixed point. It's further goes on forever. Okay. Question first, forget about the books. Question what is the behavior of this thing? How does it behave? Now, this question is a question about very elementary things. By looking at this theory, you might think, well, maybe what you mean by that question is, can you compute the scattering amplitude of the view ones in this theory? Because when you do free field analysis, this theory is a theory of mass of scattering amplitudes. So you know And maybe that you would think is the correct question to ask in this theory, or one of the correct questions to ask. But it turns out that even this is, even this, is assuming too much. You see, because you're assuming that the particles, that this theory has a particle spectrum. Okay? Where the particles are the ones. Now, certainly if the theory was free, that would be the case. Okay? But, because, uh, so if you were a fixed point, there's no question. But if we were any way away from the fixed point, and we were asking questions about arbitrarily long time, arbitrarily long distance behavior, as is necessary when you're doing an S matrix calculation. Okay, you prepare something in infinity, we have a very long time calculation. Um, it's not clear. No, of course, you don't know the answer, you think this will be a bit perverse, but it's not clear that even the question you're asking is good. One. It's not clear that the particle spectrum of the theory, okay, that the particle spectrum of the theory is, includes duals. I mean, of course, you've all got used to the statement, space surprising statement. But as far as we can tell, it's true. Okay. Yangle's theory appears to have this uh, this dynamical property, uh, sometimes referred to as confinement. And that property goes, goes um, um, that probably basically is the statement that there are no asymptotic states in the theory that transform non trivially under the SUN gauge group. And the global part of the SUN okay. In particular, glue ones, which transform non trivially, transform the adjoint representations, are not particles of the same. Okay? In fact, it is strongly believed to not prove in any in the way that will mean will win you a million dollars. You know, it's a clay foundation. That it offers a million dollars to somebody who can prove for everything. Proof science. That um, and it has not been proved, but it's strongly suspected. Oh, I think by this is standard, we should say no. That this theory, in fact, has a mass gap. What does that mean? It has a vacuum. Of it. It has a vacuum of it. The first excited state about the vacuum is not an arbitrarily low end, as it would have been if gluons were part but in the cell, is that a fixed energy above? Is 
without some fixed energy about the vacuum. Okay. First claim. Second claim. Um, the spectrum of particles in the state is entirely made up of signals. In fact, think of these as, uh, roughly speaking, as two gluon bound states that are arranged so that this bound state is color neutral. If we were doing SU2, you can easily imagine that. Uh, SU2, uh, the adjoint is just a vector of SO3. And uh, a bound state of two vectors where the indices contract is a scalar, so it doesn't transform. So you can arrange bound states of two adjoints to give you a signal. This is a general theory, this is a general thing. Product of two adjoints. Now, the spectrum of this theory is roughly you can think of as bound states of two gluons. Maybe there are other ways of thinking. There are other and these, these, the spectrum of these, 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 these particles are refer, referred to as gluons. So, purely Eigner's theory, we strongly believe in the theory of gluons. Now, when we add quarks to the theory, the statement that Gluons are not good asymptotic states in the theory. Carries on to the statement that quarks also are not good asymptotic states in the theory. Because quarks are also uh, common objects. In fact, the spectrum of particles in the theory includes gluons and bilinears of the quark fields, which are sometimes called mesons. And then more complicated objects. Okay, you can form singlets in SU3 by taking three fundamentals using the epsilon tensor. Okay. Uh, and uh, uh, these, these objects are called bands. Okay. So the claim is that the spectrum of this Yangman theory with the, um, the glue of, uh, including quarks is made up of glue walls, mesons, and barriers. Okay. Now, it's not the same. But this is the kind of thing we're going to try to understand. Okay, this is the kind of thing we want to understand. Okay, so you see the extent. You see the extent to which quantum field theory can surprise. Not only is it a hard task to compute the S matrices of the objects of the free field theory once the theory starts to interact. Sometimes that's even the wrong question. The particle spectrum. The basic organization of the Hilbert space theory can turn out to be very different from what perturbation, from what the free theory or perturbation theory around it can, can suggest. This, of course, can only happen if the coupling constant increases to be quite large, re uh, relevant for the relevant question that you're asking. Okay? And uh, this is the kind of thing that we want to try to understand to the extent that we can um, in the angular theory. Now, for elementary angular theory, everything that I've told you about has some qualitative understanding, some pictures, and a lot of numerical confirmation. Okay? But in two dimensions, in the large end limit, this you can prove to be true. Okay? And uh, uh, so, for this reason, the larger limits of uh, uh, theories involving n cross n vectors. Okay? And it turns out that the study of larger limits involving theories involving n cross n matrices is much more interesting uh, than that of the n cross n matrices. So, this is what we're going to do. And we're going to approach the study, this first way of studying the simple term. Question? Yeah, for instance, the gluon fields. All these fields here, the AMU fields, are adjoint value fields. So in UN, you should think of them as matrices. Okay, that's why we study larger limits involving n cross n matrices. Now, this will be relevant to the study of AMU. Okay? So, um, in order to keep this discussion as concrete as possible, Okay. We will start with the simple, the simplest example, of simplest solvable example, and yet non-trivial, of the study of an um, of an integral 
involving an imperfect. And the thing we can study is the problem. Consider the integral over n cross n commission matrices. And times exponential of minus v. Trace. Okay? Exponential minus trace we have. Well, V is an arbitrary real potential of uh, potential function. What is the theory? It's quantum field theory at one space time point. It's just a plain integral. It's not even quantum mechanics. Okay. Already this, this problem has some interest. We will study the quantum mechanics also. First in the lab. Okay, now can you guess how I should scale? Can you guess whether this guy here will have a good larger end of the I've written. You see, the, the rules are always that you should scale entropy and energy in the same way, like we did now. Here, the entropy. Is like n squared, because they're n squared. Means. So we should want this energy to scale like n squared. But this trace here is a sum of n terms. Okay? So you might expect that this trace scales like n. For this reason, let us study this. Okay? e to the power minus n trace.
แต่ all the other ตั้งแต่ตัว and the special factors the analog of this two pi r okay the other analogy with that close up is to doing this in three dimensions suppose we doing this in three dimensions this would be a function only for any group then this would be four pi r squared the r f of r Okay, what's the analogy here? The analogy here is that we're doing an integral over a lot of variables, but the integral cares only some of them. Uh, comes out, cares only about some of them. You just do the integral of the the variables it doesn't care about first. All that does is induce an effective pressure factor for the variables that it does care about. Okay, so now, so okay. Now let's let's go let's go uh, uh, let's 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 go uh, let's go steps. Okay. So suppose this M here was an uh, suppose the M here was a traceless two cross two Hermitian matrix. Okay. Then n could be written as alpha i sigma. The sigma is the three public matrices. Okay. So one way to parametrize the space of these ends is by these three alpha i's. Okay. What do similarity transforms by S U do to do to these three sigma i's? Like vectors of SO3. Okay, so in fact, this particular example, <coughs> the space of two cro two cross two traceless emission matrices, is parametrized by three numbers with SU2 invariance, which is rotations in three dimensional space. So it's really the example we talked about. With a three dimensional space, the uh, the uh, the eigenvalues are the radial distance away from here. Okay, uh, can you see this? For instance, suppose there's only one alpha. Then let's say only sigma three. Then the eigenvalues would be plus or minus alpha three. But since it's rotational, then it can only be square root of alpha one square plus alpha two square plus alpha three square plus or minus that. Right. So the eigenvalues care only about the radial location. So this integral here cares only about the radial location. Whereas the angular locations, we can just do the integral. And in that case, the analysis that we did previously tells us what the right measure factor is. Up to some number, the measure factor uh, simply is, okay, up to some number, the measure factor uh, simply is Alpha square. Okay? Now what what was alpha? This alpha as we've said is the ideal value. So, so we have two, we have a matrix. Once we did diagonalize the ideal value is alpha and minus alpha. Okay? So we could write this as let's call it alpha one and alpha two. As alpha one minus alpha two. In fact, you can easily convince yourself. That if we generalize to U2 to, to uh, uh, not traces, but arbitrary uh -huh, to uh -huh, arbitrary emission matrices. But now the two eigenvalues are not necessarily equal in all Because there's a U1 piece as well. It's a piece proportional to identity. Okay? Now, but you can easily convince yourself that in that case, it's just a factorization of this. The three-dimensional space times a one-dimensional Okay, and so the uh, the integration measure becomes d alpha one d alpha two alpha one minus alpha two squared. That's the number which is easy to keep track of to the number of the two cells. Now, what we want to do is to understand the n-dimensional generalization of this. Is this clear by the way? 
Ja, ja. Is this clear? That if we claim we're doing an integration over a 2 cross 2 permission matrices, same as doing an integral over the eigenvalues with a measure factor alpha 1 minus alpha 2, the whole thing square by alpha 1 and alpha 2. Okay. Now we want to generalize this to. Okay. Before doing that, uh, just, I mean, let that stop. But before, before, before doing that, let's intuitively understand where the square came from. What was the intuition for the square? The point was the following. You see, the point was the following. The point was that, suppose I've got a 2 cross 2 matrix. Okay, and its eigenvalue happened to be equal. Then, the space of rotations by the similarity transforms don't change my matrix anymore. Because u times identity times u inverse is just identity. On the other hand, if the eigenvalues are different, then the similarity transforms move you around. Okay? The measure factor is the volume of that space in which you're moved around. Okay? Think again of the three-dimensional three-dimensional space and rotations. There is a fixed point on the rotations, namely the origin. Okay? And as you go away from there, so at the origin, rotations don't change the origin. They just leave it fixed. But if you go away from there, rotations cause spheres. And the size of the sphere that you made, which is R squared, is the measure factor. Okay? So, this a generic feature of these measure factors is the following. That if this measure factor comes because you've got some symmetry action, and there's a fixed point of that symmetry action, okay, then you have to know the co-dimension of that fixed point. How many, how many parameters do you have to tune in order to reach that fixed Okay? In this case, we saw the number of parameters we had to tune was 3. Because there were 3. There was alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 2. To reach the fixed point, all eigenvalues had to be equal. That only works if alpha 1 is equal to alpha 2, is equal to alpha 3, is equal to 0. So it's a co-dimension 3 fixed point. And then the measure factor is R square, just like in, at least in the neighborhood of the point, is R square just like in flat space. Okay? So this, the fact that this that there's a vanishing measure point at alpha 1 equals alpha 2 is because the unitary transformations have a fixed point at alpha 1 equals alpha 2. The fact that there is that, that it was square was because the co-dimension of that fixed point was tiny. You have to tune three parameters to reach that fixed point. That gives you the value. The quantity square. Okay? Now, suppose we've got an n cross n matrix. If any two eigenvalues become equal, part of the symmetry group and SU2 some group of this full SUN symmetry group of rotations becomes fixed at that point any two eigenvalues become equal that requires a co-dimension 3 so this tells you that the measure factor whatever it is right there is a measure factor whatever it is must have a 0 of order 2 supported when any two eigenvalues come, become equal. Is this clear? So, it must be that this measure factor is d alpha 1, d alpha 2, d alpha n times product over i, i and j, alpha i minus alpha j, i not equal, uh, let's say i less than j, square. Times something else. Times something else which you know is not zero or singular. Uh, as I was to take. Times anything. But now what could this something else be? What? What do you mean as I go to J? So it's some function of I uh, alpha I and alpha J? No, no, as I as alpha I goes to J. Alright. Alright. What could this something else be? You see. This measure factor 
has a certain homogeneity in the beginning. How do we judge the homogeneity? The original integral that we wanted to do was an integral over n squared I, uh, n squared matrix elements. Okay? So it was a, of, of dimensionality matrix element to the pi n squared. The final integral that we are going to do is over n eigenvalues. So the measure factor has to have dimensionality matrix element or eigenvalue, eigenvalue to the power n squared minus n. Right? But this object here you can easily check does have dimensionality eigenvalue to the power n squared minus n. Why? Because how many numbers are there for i less than j? n to n minus 1 by 2. But the dimension of this object is 2. So this exhausts the uh, this exhausts the homogeneity. Okay? Now, so anything else that you get here would have to be some function uh, with zero dimensionality. Okay? Such things would are basically impossible to arrange without having singularity sum. For instance, suppose you had alpha 1 by alpha. Uh, okay? When alpha 2 went to 0, then it would be singular, but that's crazy. Okay? So, arguments of this nature uh, can convince you quite, certainly with a great deal of plausibility, that this and some number is the correct measure. Okay. But, you know, these what else could it be type arguments are never completely convinced. Okay? Uh, so, suppose you actually want to compute it. There's a very simple way. And that very simple way, uh, I'm going to leave as an exercise for you, is to apply the Fadi form of trick. Okay? This is a very simple example of a theory of the gates of The gates of is just unitary dimensions. So I'm going to leave this as an exercise for you. Okay? Apply the Fadi form of trick. You remember the point of the Fadi form of trick was to change the integral over all gauge configurations to integral only over gauge orbits with the right measure factor. That's exactly what we're doing here. In this case, the gauge orbits are labeled by the eigenvalues. Okay? The original integral is over with all gauge configurations. We want to integrate only over gauge orbits. It's a measure factor. Fadil and Popov gave us a beautiful trick to do that. I'd like you to apply this trick to derive this one. You can do that including the number. Okay, um, I'm going to leave this as an exercise for you, you people. And, uh, uh, okay, uh, I, I think we've exhausted our 12 o'clock limit. So I'll finish the analysis of this model next class and then we'll move on to really studying it. Okay, um, well, yeah, when is the next? That's a good question. So when, when, when will we next not have all of this? Uh, is Wednesday? Wednesday is fine, right? Uh, let's, let's schedule a class for next week. You have a clash? I will have a class at the other time for Windows. Okay. I'll have to just check with various things. Uh, if possible, I'll say it. Okay.